joining us online. Just um, we're going to pray and get going in a minute studying the New Testament canon. I just want to uh, remind everybody our format is I'm going to go through some material, then open things up for uh, questions. And if anybody out there in Facebook land has a question, you can definitely um, go ahead and ask the question in the comments on our, uh, you know, video. And I, I'll see those comments on my laptop if they come up. Okay, well, let's pray. And tonight we're talking about the New Testament canon. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight. And I just pray that you will be glorified through our study, Lord. I just pray that as we think about... Uh, the processes that have happened in the history of the church, just that we will know that we have a very, uh, very solid Bible, and we ask you for these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so last week we, of course, concluded our study of the Old Testament canon. The New Testament canon is, is more important just in the sense that the New Testament is kind of the capstone of God's revelation. And so um, there's the, the, the process is what we're going to talk about to some degree, but a couple of things I want to say is kind of an intro. One, they weren't really generally arguing about whether they should make the New Testament bigger. See, when you hear like in Time Magazine or on CNN periodically, they have these articles or these specials, and they always want to talk about the books that got left out of the Bible. And you see that stuff all the time. When we look at the canonizing process in the early church, they weren't trying to make the New Testament bigger. The main questions were whether the New Testament had too many books or whether it needed to be trimmed down. And so some of them were questioned. And there are a couple of books that, that, that occasional teachers would think could be included in the canon, but these never gained any great wide acceptance. And they're not usually the kind of books of the Bible that you uh, that you hear about on the news. Um, just a funny little story. When I was in seminary, um, the big thing was like the lost gospels, the the secret gospels. And we'll talk about those uh, either either by the end of tonight or possibly next week, depending on how far we get. But um, what had happened when I was in seminary was the film The Da Vinci Code had come out. The book had come out, then the film had come out. And this was very popular. And one of the characters in The Da Vinci Code says that there were like over 80 Gospels, but only four of them made the cut. Now, by any, by any estimate, now, of course, we want to say, we want to note that The Da Vinci Code was a fiction novel. It wasn't, you know, that's not history. It's fiction. And in fiction, you can make stuff up. That's okay. That's why it's fiction. But a lot of people kind of took that seriously, and a lot of people got confused about that fiction and thought that was really true. And I mean, the simple matter is, it really wasn't. Now, if we were to define the term gospel really broadly, then we might could get almost 40. But we would be defining the word gospel in a way that we really shouldn't be defined. More about that later if we get that far tonight. For now, let's start with talking about the actual canon. Um, a review point as well is that, again, the canon is not an authoritative list of books. It is a list of authoritative books. In other words, the church did not determine the books that were canonical. That was determined when God inspired the books. Rather, the church recognized them. So talking about the process of canonization is, is uh, talking about the process by which the church recognized the canon. So, first point, talking about the recognition of the canon. When we talk about um, the recognition of the canon, there's one point that's very important. There are 27 books in our New Testament. Starting with Matthew and ending with Revelation, that's 27 books. 20 of them were never questioned. 22 of them were hardly questioned, and five of them were questioned, but determined to get in. So think about that. 20 books in the New Testament were never questioned, and if we had a New Testament that only had 20 books, it would change our overall Christian doctrine very little. So um, going back to some terms we use for the Old Testament and kind of uh, applying them to the New Testament, the term homo legomena, and hopefully you people out there in uh, cyberland can see this, but if you can't, this is New Testament, NT stands for New Testament. 
New Testament homo legomena means the undisputed books, and there are 22 books that are considered undisputed or homo legomena. And I'll just uh, walk through these. There is uh, the Gospels. So we've got four Gospels. We have the book of Acts, Paul's 13 letters. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. All of those are undisputed by the early church. Some of them were disputed, you know, in like the 19th century, but that's another discussion altogether. But they were not disputed in the early church. Um, 1 John was not disputed. 1 Peter was not disputed. Now, I want you to notice I have down here Hebrews and Revelation, and I have an asterisk by each of those. And that's why we say 20 were undisputed and 22 were hardly disputed, because there was some dispute over Hebrews and Revelation, but not a lot. So the disputed books, oh my goodness. And they're important New Testament books that were included in the canon, but the ones that the church disputed were James, the book of James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. So James has five chapters. I'm not good at math, but do some math, do some math with me. James has five chapters. Um, 2 Peter has three chapters, so we have eight so far. Um, 2 and 3 John each are only one chapter apiece, so that's, uh, that makes 10, and Jude is one chapter. So really only 11 chapters of the entire New Testament had any serious dispute. So that's, a, that's an introductory point, and again, note, if our New Testament didn't have the book of James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude, we would be missing a lot of good stuff, but it wouldn't really alter our overall Christian doctrine very much. Hmm. Before starting the canon series, some of you remember I did a series on the book of Jude. Did I ever mention why I did a series on the book of Jude? There's a few reasons, but one of them was I have never heard anybody else teach a series on the book of Jude. So I wanted to be the first person I knew who, who taught a series on the book of Jude. The point I'm making there is these books, other than, other than James, these books don't always get a whole lot of attention. James gets a lot, but so, okay, point made, I think. Uh, all right. Um, in terms of these books being treated as scripture, when, when, when we're talking about some councils, and we'll talk about that a little, there was a kind of a church stamp of approval but when we look at the way these churches, these, uh, pardon me, <laughs> getting a little tongue-tied here. When we look at the way these books were treated by the early church fathers, we see that they were always treated as scripture when they were quoted or when they were used. Now, when we, when we use the term early church fathers, you might not be familiar with that term, but here's what we're talking about. The first generation of Christian teachers were the apostles and their associates. So we call that sometimes the apostolic generation in Christianity. That's like the first generation. After that, we have the generation of the early church fathers, which were the earliest church teachers who were teaching basically based on the writings of the apostles. And they were quoting the New Testament books all over the place, especially the ones that you find in the homo legomena. Um, and when we look at the way they quote them, we can see that a lot of the fathers had kind of their own canonical list, but we can see emerging a very, very consistent group of books that make up the New Testament canon. I'm going to give you a few lists. Um, I was going to write these on the board, but... I didn't want to write it while I'm talking, and, and I wanted to, I didn't have room for everything, so I'm going to read these off. If you want copies of these lists, um, send me a, uh, let me know in the comments, and I can send you a document that has the notes I'm using for the study. But the early fathers, they had their own uh, list where they would talk about what books they considered to be authoritative, and we see kind of a list emerging that looks very much like the one we've got. I do want to mention that in these lists, a lot of these guys weren't saying these are the only authoritative books. They were just saying these books are authoritative. So they're not necessarily exhaustive lists. That means they aren't necessarily saying these are all the authoritative books. But one of the most famous of the early fathers and one of the earliest is a guy named Polycarp. 
Polycarp was a uh, disciple of the Apostle John. The Apostle John is uh, one of Jesus' apostles. He, he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Book of Revelation. And one of the guys he taught was a guy named Polycarp. Here are the books that Polycarp mentions as authoritative. He mentions the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John, the Book of Acts, the Book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Hebrews, and 1st Peter. Now again, Polycarp isn't necessarily saying those are the only authoritative books, but he does list all of those as authoritative. All right. Uh, Polycarp lived, by the way, from 70 AD to about 160 AD. So he lived to be about 90. And actually, he's got kind of a cool story. He died a martyr's death when he was 90 years old. Not a lot of people lived to 90 in those in those days, and uh, a lot of that not a lot of them um, <laughs> died martyr's deaths either. All right. Uh, the next guy we would talk about is a guy named Justin Martyr. Speaking of martyrs, his last name actually is Martyr. Um, the word martyr, by the way, means witness. Um, Justin Martyr, the books that he said were authoritative, he mentioned Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so that's the four Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. And once again, Justin Martyr wasn't necessarily giving an exhaustive list, but he does have testimony to each of those books. Um, the next guy we would mention is a guy by the name of Irenaeus. That name is spelled I-R-E-N-A-E-U-S. And Irenaeus lived from about 1 AD 150 to uh, AD 202. And he was a disciple of Polycarp. So he was one of Polycarp's students. Irenaeus lists almost all of our New Testament as canonical. And again, he's not necessarily giving an exhaustive list, but he mentions uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so the Gospels, Acts, Romans, um, all of Paul's epistles with the exception of Philemon. He doesn't mention Philemon, but he mentions all of Paul's other epistles. He mentions Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd John, Jude and Revelation. And uh, in addition to that, he also mentions um, a book called The Shepherd of Hermas. So Irenaeus does have another book that he mentions that doesn't appear in our New Testament, but it, it was a fairly popular book in, in the early church. Most people did not think it was part of uh, canonical literature. Um, we'll go through some of this quickly and then we'll, then we'll get to the next points. I don't want to data dump you with lists, but um, Tertullian had almost exactly the same list as uh, Irenaeus. Tertullian lived a little later than Irenaeus. He also um, he also added a couple of books that aren't in our New Testament, but he's but not very not very many people would have added these as canonical. And these are books you don't usually hear about on CNN. He mentioned the wisdom of Solomon and the apocalypse of Peter. I want, to, I want to tell you guys a story about that kind of a funny story. Just uh, when all that was going on with the Da Vinci Code, I was going through this list. I was actually teaching a class, the first class I taught, and it was part of my uh, master's program in Dallas. And I was teaching, uh, the, the class was a class uh, it was called, at a place called the Center for Biblical Studies. And what it was is seminary students, like myself at the time, we would teach classes for um, lay people in town who just wanted to learn more about the Bible. And I was teaching about what we call bibliology or the study of the Bible. And I was telling you about these lists in the early church. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, they were saying, you know, when they heard about, well, a couple of the fathers thought the shepherd of Hermas or the wisdom of Solomon or the apocalypse of Peter were canonical. They were like, well, those aren't the ones you hear about on CNN, you know. And that's because... They're perhaps not as exciting, and, you know, they just were, didn't really have any sort of wide, wide acceptance. All right, um, Eusebius of Caesarea has almost exactly the same list of books as the previous two, and it's almost exactly the same as our New Testament, just missing a couple. Uh, if you want that list, again, you can, you can ask for these notes. The first person to give the exact list of our current canon was an early church teacher by the name of Athanasius. Athanasius of Alexandria, that would be 
Alexandria, Egypt. Um, so again, these were not official canonical lists in the church. These were early church teachers who were listing the books that they understood to be authoritative, not necessarily saying these are all of them, but saying they considered these ones authoritative. And the point is, when you look at these lists, they look almost exactly like our modern day New Testament, maybe with a few, you know, a few that aren't there. And occasionally one of them would throw something else in like the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, but by the time of Athanasius, we have the exact canon we have today. There's another, um, there's another element to this or another event in the history of the church. The first time the church compiled an official list that was put together by a group of people in the church. And this is called the Marturian Canon. I'm going to write this down here, actually. I'm not going to write a lot, but the... Write big here so hopefully everyone can see. So the Marturian canon was um, what happened was there was an early church false teacher. His name was Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. And Marcion, he was, he was trying to start his own religious movement to counter true or what we call orthodox Christianity. What Marcion did was he basically, and I'm speaking in metaphor, but he took a pair of scissors to the Bible. He said parts of the Bible are the word of God and parts aren't. And so he basically, and it was a little easier to do this because you were dealing with scrolls and things like that back then. So he basically said that most of the Bible wasn't the word of God. He had some teachings of his own, and what he did was he basically got rid of everything in the Bible that didn't agree with his teachings. And, of course, nothing in the Bible agreed with his teachings, but when you, when you carve up the Bible and you just take a, a section here and a section there, it's really easy to try to make the Bible say things it's not saying. That is what happened uh, in the days of Marcion. And so when Marcion, he tried to change the Bible, this is something that happens a lot of times. A lot of very good Christian teaching comes in response to false teachers. False teachers are teaching something that is obviously false. And so the true church says, well, we have to be very clear on what the real truth is. And so um, what the true church did was a group of a group of early fathers, a group of church teachers uh, got together and they put together what they called the Marturian Canon. The Marturian Canon doesn't include everything our contemporary New Testament. It's a little smaller than, than our final form of the New Testament, but it doesn't add anything else. So the first official list of recognized books uh, was the Marturian Canon, and that included the four Gospels, Paul's 13 letters, 1st and 2nd John, Jude, and Revelation. So the point here is most of our New Testament was in the earliest list a group of guys got together and put together. Um, again, not all of these were necessarily exhaustive, but what we, what we keep seeing is we keep seeing a consistent list that was looking a lot more like the New Testament canon as we have it today. All right, what there was after this in, in the history of the church that we'll talk about in a minute is there was a series of councils where the canon, the New Testament canon as we have it today, was officially recognized. But before I talk about the councils, um, I want to give a few minutes if there are any questions, and we'll take questions from out there in Facebook land if, uh, if anybody wants to ask those as well. I hope that, um, I hope this video is still working because I can't tell for sure from my end, but I think so. Right. Questions so far, anybody? I want to check something. Your wife had to do a sermon on Jude. Oh, I didn't do I didn't do sermons on Jude. What I did was in our Wednesday night Bible study when I was live streaming it, but we weren't actually meeting. I did a Bible study series on Jude, and so that's um, yeah, that's what we uh, that's what we're talking about there. I think that's 
my comment is on the Marcion guy and other false teachers. Or, mm -hmm. um, so it actually, having people like that kind of helps uh, people grow in their, their Christianity because then it causes people to dig deeper for the, what is the true meaning of yeah. the gospel or book or... Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a that's a really important point. This is something you learn. Um, one of the things we we I studied in in seminary is uh, historical theology or the history of Christianity. Historical theology is looking at how Christian beliefs or doctrines came into being. And a lot of times, it's not that it's not that the doctrines weren't taught before, but a lot of times they were very much clarified when um when false teachers were teaching falsehoods the church was like well that's different than what the church has already taught but let's kind of make official what the true church teaching is on this subject so you know false teachers of course are a bad thing and the bible warns us about them but god actually can use them to do positive things because god is you know that that great and powerful All right. I want to make. I want to very briefly. I'm going to talk about some church councils here, and I want to very briefly mention a council called the Council of Nicaea. I'm not going to talk about it for very long, but the only reason I mention the Council of Nicaea is because a lot of people think that the Council of Nicaea had anything to do with the canon and the formation of the canon. In fact, in the Da Vinci Code, it says, "Well, at the Council of Nicaea, they chose these gospels or whatever." The Council of Nicaea had absolutely nothing to do with the canon. It wasn't about that. That is a, uh, you know, a historical error. It was other councils. The Council of Nicaea was about the doctrine of the Trinity. And we'll talk about that another time. However, um, we do have a series of councils where the church kind of put its official stamp of approval on the canon as we know it today. Um, so just in review, there's always been a very consistent core of New Testament teaching, and the councils didn't determine that these books were scripture, but they had discussions and they recognized which books were scripture. Um, the first council, let me see something here. My computer keeps wanting to do funny things. The first council where this happened was called the Synod of Laodicea. Synod is kind of a, a synonym for a council. The Synod of Laodicea happened in um, 363 AD. Laodicea is a uh, city in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And um, at Laodicea, as far as we can tell, the, the records from the Council of Laodicea or the Synod of Laodicea are a little bit sketchy, but as far as we can tell, the church officially recognized the canon as we know it today. Um, the next council related to the canon was the Council of Hippo, and this is uh, in AD 393. Hippo is a city in Africa, I believe. Yeah, hippos come from there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but at the Council of Hippo, and this is like just, uh, you know, about a little bit over 350 years after Christ rose from the dead, this is the first council where they clearly recognized the 27 books we have today. And one of the things they were doing at these councils is they're discussing the anti-legomena and determining whether they felt like the anti-legomena should be included. Uh, the Synod of Carthage is another one where they're like, well, we need to discuss this a little more. And the Synod of Carthage, that's in North Africa as well, reaffirmed what they determined at the um, Council of Hippo, the 27 books we have today. And the Council of Carthage, and this is the last council that had to do with the canon, of course, until the Council of Trent, where they tried to introduce the Apocrypha over a thousand years later. But, um, of course, that would be Old Testament anyway. But at the Council of Carthage, they reaffirmed the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, I want to remind you that when we were talking about the Apocrypha before, the Apocrypha has to do with the size of the New Testament. When we're dealing with... Um, when we're dealing with Protestant, Christians, Evangelicals, Roman Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox, we're all agreeing on the size of the New Testament. The 27 books of the New Testament aren't disputed by those, by those groups, only the uh, Old Testament. All right, so 
pretty much all four of these councils reaffirmed or affirmed the um, inspiration, the canonicity, the authority of the 27 books that appear in our New Testament. I'll read you a quote from a theologian named Norman Geisler, and it uh, kind of summarizes how this went, and then we'll talk a little more about the anti-legomena in a minute. But Geisler, Norman Geisler says this, while there was some debate about the books that had initially been accepted into the New Testament church, eventually the universal Christian church came to pronounce unanimously on the 27 books of the present New Testament canon. And there has been no significant debate since around 400 AD. So this issue of the 27 books of the Bible, this hasn't really been much of a debate since 400 AD. Not until like the last... To, I don't know, a couple of hundred years when a few uh, a few guys here and there wanted to say, well, hey, wait a minute. What about these other books that were big in the early church? But they were never big in the Orthodox church or, or the true church. Let's put it that way. All right, I want to talk a little more about the anti-legomena, but before we do, any, uh, any quick questions? Kathleen, I see that question. I will send you the notes. Let me see something. Do we have more questions here? Pardon me out there in Facebook land. Okay, we don't. Good. I have one. Go ahead, Holly. So if all of the books of the Old and the New Testament you know, are supposed to be God-inspired or Christ-inspired, mm -hmm. or they are, then why would they sit around and discuss um, what books are important and not important? Yeah. Isn't it all important? Well, for that for that very reason, I'm going to rephrase your question. One, so you can tell me if I'm understanding it right, but two, so everyone out there can hear the question that we're um, answering. The question was, if all of the books of the Bible are the Word of God, divinely inspired, then why are we sitting around and questioning some of them? Would that be a fair uh, a fair summary? Okay, so here's the thing, and and... A lot of this comes down to our viewpoint on truth, because there are so many things in life, as we all know, you've got your opinion, I've got my opinion, right? And we Christians, what we believe about the Bible, it's funny, I don't even have a Bible here, I'd hold it up and look cool, but um, we believe that the Bible is God's absolute truth. What we mean is that when God speaks, God is right. Now, a lot of people are like, well, God told me this, or God told me that. But the thing is, if God told you something, you need to tell me. That doesn't help me, because we have some people who say God told them this, and some people say God told them this, and they don't agree, right? When we have the Bible, for since, since AD 400, we're agreeing, Christianity has agreed that whatever God may have said to this, that, or the other person, we know he said these things. Those have absolute authority for the way we live our lives. That means that we, we don't want to add anything in and say it's the word of God when it's really not. We, don't want, to, we want to make sure that, that the word of God doesn't get added to. But we also want to make sure that the word of God doesn't get taken away from. Now, because a lot of this was based on the use of these books in the early church, when we're talking about the homo legomena, we talked about the early fathers. They quoted these books all the time. And you, you look at the early church, and it is very clear that from the very beginning, from the moment these were written, people understood they were the word of God. Now, the anti-legomena, it's not that people were saying these weren't the word of God. They just weren't being quoted as widely. They weren't as well known among the early church teachers. And some people had some questions about, about some of the teaching. Is this teaching, is the teaching in these consistent with the teaching in these? The church determined that it was, and having studied these myself, I believe so too. But they asked these questions because they wanted to take the word of God that seriously. And while these are, while these are great little books, if they weren't the word of God, they wanted to make absolutely sure that... They didn't include anything that was not the word of God. I'm going to go through some of this in more detail about the specific books, but 
That's the answer because they took it so so seriously. Drop my water bottle. Pardon me out there, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to give you an example. Okay, so here's an example. Every Sunday, as you guys know, I preach sermons here at High Point. Those of you out there who want to uh, you know watch them, you can go to our church website or my YouTube. Now. When I preach these sermons, I don't tell you guys anything that I think I'm wrong about. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't tell you if I didn't think it was true, but I'm not only reading the Bible out loud. I do that, and then I talk about it and try to explain it. I guarantee you everything I say isn't 100% accurate. I'm doing the best I can to teach God's word, but I'm not right all the time. If I knew what I was wrong about, I would not say it, but none of us are perfect because we're not God. So I do my, the best I can to teach the word of God, but what I'll always tell you is the Bible is the word of God. Whatever it says, you are bound by. I'm going to do the best I can to explain the Bible. There's a possibility that I might get something wrong, so you want to check me. You want to make sure you're reading your Bible enough that if I say anything that sounds wacky, um, you will uh, you will be able to catch. Oh, wait a minute. That's, uh, that's not quite right there. Pete. But if it's the Bible, we don't question that. So if James was writing authoritative scripture, we don't question what he says. If he wasn't, then we could think, well, James wrote a really good book, but he could have been wrong about this or that. Really good question. And uh, yeah, Okay. Let me talk a little bit more about the Antilegomena. Just talk about each of these books and why they were questioned. Um, did I... I think I skipped something. Let me see if I can. Okay, let me actually, I'm going to backtrack a minute and then talk about the anti-legomena. I skipped something so important. In fact, it's so important. I am going to flip my board over so I can write this down. Make it work. There it is. I knew I could do it. Okay. Sorry, I skipped a very important point, and we don't want to skip this. What was the basis? What was the criteria? So if we're talking about whether a book is or is not the word of God, what is the criteria by which we would determine whether it was the word of God? And let me just give you a few of four. There are basically four basic criteria. One of them, and the most important one, is actually... Um, is actually the one that, that, you know, you could probably argue is not as easy to measure, but it's the most important, which is, often we call it the self-authenticating divine nature. What we mean by self-authenticating divine nature is when you read it, it has spiritual power. You can tell it's the word of God because of the power that it has in your life. It authenticates itself. Now, Christians who read the Bible, they say, well, the self-authenticating divine nature makes it very clear that the Bible is, in fact, the word of God. And, but at the same time, other people who have other inspired literature, other religions might say the same thing about their books. And so that wouldn't be, wouldn't be true in a Christian context. However, a lot of these books, what it really came down to is when people were reading it, they could tell it was the word of God. But a couple more criteria that were applied. One is called the rule of faith. What am I talking about here? The apostles began teaching the things Jesus taught them a long time before they started writing them down. Right? Jesus rose from the dead in AD 33, give or take. The apostles went out and started teaching the things that Jesus taught them in roughly 83, uh, AD, AD 33, give or take, 
And the last apostle to die was the apostle John, who, who probably died in exile on the island of Patmos in about AD 95, all right? So in that time, in addition to writing the New Testament, the apostles for this 60 or so year period are teaching all the time. And, then, and in, that, in those early days, the early fathers, many of them, they either remembered what the apostles taught, like Polycarp, or they knew what the guys the apostles taught taught. For example, um, Martin Luther King Jr. is not alive today, right? But a lot of people still remember what he said. And of course, we know what he said because we have videos of what he said. But even if we didn't have the videos, and even if it wasn't written down, enough people are alive today that heard Martin Luther King Jr. give speeches that they can remember what he said. There's kind of a collection of what the apostles taught that people remembered for 60 years. So if a book disagreed with what the apostles had taught, it would disagree with the rule of faith. And we would know that's not scripture because that's not what the apostles had said. The third criterion here is uh, what we would call um, universal acceptance. Okay, so fix this real quick again. Universal acceptance, part of what part of what universal acceptance has to do with is the Christian church grew very fast in the ancient world. And so we have churches in Jerusalem. We have churches all the way over in a place called Parthia, which would be like modern day Iraq. We have churches in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. In fact, we have churches all over North Africa, and as time goes on, we start having churches in Europe. And as we have these churches, do they agree on these books of the Bible? If one book was only accepted in, let's say, Parthia, but it's not accepted over in Alexandria, then we're going to have more questions about that one. It doesn't have this uh, universal acceptance. And so uh, it had to be widely accepted, and with the anti-legomena, that was some of the issue. Was it widely accepted, and then, um, let me see, that is three, let me see, the final thing we would talk about has to do with who wrote it, and we call this apostolicity. That means that it had to have been written in the apostolic generation which means before the death of the Apostle John, and it had to either have been written by the Apostles or one of their close associates. So most of the New Testament was written by the Apostles themselves, but we have a few books that were not written by Apostles. The Gospel of Mark was written by Mark. Mark was not an Apostle, but he was a close associate of both Peter and Paul. Uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were written by Luke believe it or not. Luke was not an apostle, but he was a close associate of the apostle Paul. And we could go through a couple of other examples, but so it had to either be written by an apostle or somebody who was a very close associate of theirs. Go ahead. The prophet. I mean, you said uh, the content of the Bible were written by a prophet. Oh, written by a prophet. Right. Well, see, when we were in the Old Testament, we were talking about propheticity. It had to be written by a prophet. The New Testament books would all be written by prophets. These people, the, the, the associates of the apostles who wrote it would all be considered prophets because scripture is a written form of prophecy. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, in the New Testament, the, the head honchos, the main teachers are the apostles. And, yeah, but all of their associates would definitely be prophets. Go ahead, Holly. I was just going to say all the books um, in the Bible, they pretty much go together or, you know, it's like an even flow in other chapters or other books you can cross-reference with another one so that's, yeah um, another kind of proof that yeah so holly made the point that when you look at the bible it all goes together there's there is a linear story and everything fits together and that definitely is an argument for the uh, you know for the genuineness of the fact that the, the correct books were included were included in the bible 
universally accepted. It says, did they, um, was, it, was it accepted by God's people? Would that, would that go with the universal acceptance? Yeah. Yeah, universal. Yeah, was it was it accepted universally in the church? And we do want to, we might, for the canon we have, we almost might want to put an asterisk here, but that's why we have the anti-legomena. I'm going to turn this back over in the time we have left. The anti-legomena is because some of the question was they weren't as widely accepted. Sometimes it wasn't that they weren't as widely accepted, but they weren't accept, widely accepted as early. In other words, some things were accepted from the very beginning, and some things that might have taken a little more time. Was it because of the regions of the world they were written in, and it just took longer to get there? Or? Holly asked, was it because of the regions of the world they were written in, and did it take longer to get there? Possibly, on some of these, we have to confess we don't, there's data we don't have on exactly why they didn't get as wide a distribution right away, but um, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a good question. I mean, generally we can get a pretty good idea of when they were written. For example, Second Peter is one of the ones that was questioned, and it didn't get as wide a distribution, but it was probably written by Peter from Rome, not all that long, or pardon me, by Peter to Rome, and not all that long before the death of Peter. But yeah, let me go through each of these, and I'll talk about why, why they were questioned, each of these anti-legomena. So if we're starting with uh, the book of James, okay, let's, uh, yeah, okay, got, a, got a few more minutes here, we'll keep going. Two reasons James was questioned. One, because it, when you read the book of James, the truth in the book of James, the things the book of James teaches, there's not as much distinct Christian truth. What I mean is Jesus is only mentioned twice in James. Uh, Jake and I are studying through Proverbs together right now. The book of James is a lot like the book of Proverbs. It's a book about wise living. It gives a series of commandments. And so some people are like, well, the book of James is all well and good, but it doesn't have a lot to say about Jesus specifically. Um, one of the reasons that it was accepted is because even though it doesn't have as much distinct Christian truth, it was pretty much universally understood that it was written by James, the brother of Jesus. And when you compare it with the Sermon on the Mount, you see that the, the, the ethical teaching in James is very similar to the teachings of Jesus. So, but that was why people had questions about James primarily because it didn't have as much distinct truth. Now, some questioned it because some of the language on the surface sounds like it's disagreeing with some things Paul says in his letters. Um, Paul says we are justified by faith alone. James seems to say we are justified by works, not only by faith. Now, when you study those more carefully, and we'll talk about that on another night, you see it's not a real contradiction. It's more like a surface-level contradiction. But... But that was some of the reasons they questioned that. But the church, in the end, they were like, this was written by the brother of Jesus. He was a close associate of the apostles. And in fact, James, the brother of Jesus, was one of the most important leaders in the early church. In Acts chapter 15, we have the Jerusalem Council, and James, the brother of Jesus, led that. So he was a pretty important uh, guy. Second Peter, this is probably the one I need to talk about the most, but I'll try to make it quick. I don't know. I feel like we don't have, I feel like there's not enough data that we need a whole other Bible study on this, we'll see. But Second Peter, here's the thing. If we ever were to have a, a Bible study at High Point where I, were, I was to teach you guys to translate New Testament Greek, man, you guys would be excited. I could give you homework and stuff, and you would have to work really hard to learn to translate the New Testament. But you would, eventually you would learn enough Greek that you would realize that when you look at First Peter, and you look at 2 Peter, the Greek in those two letters, the style is really different. Every author has their own writing style, and you're like, hey, wait a minute. When you look at the Greek in 1 Peter, in the original document, and you look at the Greek in 2 Peter, it looks like a different guy wrote it. 1 Peter looks like it was written by a very, very educated individual who knew Greek really, really well. Second Peter looks like it's written by a guy who didn't have the same vocabulary and his Greek wasn't quite as good. And so a lot of people thought, well, 
is 2 Peter a forgery? Was it actually written by the Apostle Peter? Now, the solution to that is understanding that when New Testament authors wrote their books, they didn't sit down with a quill and parchment and write themselves. They dictated. And they had what is called an amanuensis. And an amanuensis is a scribe who is doing the writing. Now, a lot of people realize that, but what a lot of people don't realize is that your amanuensis also functioned like a kind of an editor. So when we talk about the Bible being divinely inspired, it's like God inspired the apostles who then spoke and somebody wrote it down, but they may have, uh, they may have done their own ed editorial work with things like grammar, which means that God is not only working through the apostles, he's also working through the amanuensis. Most scholars think that, most evangelical scholars who believe the Bible is the word of God, think that Paul, uh, Peter used a different amanuensis with 1 Peter than 2 Peter. In fact, we know who his amanuensis was in 1 Peter. It was a guy named Silas. He also was an amanuensis for a lot of Paul's letters. Peter may have even written 2 Peter in his own hand, and that would make a lot of sense because he... He could speak Greek. We know that because he would go around preaching to the churches, but he was a fisherman who had probably, you know, learned Greek along the way. I don't know whether he wrote it himself, but either way, he probably used a different amanuensis. And that's uh, that's generally, I mean, that's something the church realized very early on, and that's what, what the church has uh, universally accepted as the explanation since these early councils. All right. Second and third John, they weren't questioned for any reason much. They were questioned mostly because they're so short. If you can go home tonight and read second and third John, they're really short and they don't say a lot. And so that's why people thought, well, this, should this really be scripture? I mean, they just don't have a whole lot to say. But they decided, yeah, but they were written by the apostle John. So that's a pretty important writer. We better include those. And, you know, that's good because uh, so we know, you know, about Diogenes and Diotrephus and all of that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the book of Jude. We were just studying the book of Jude. And, and if you weren't in that study, you can go to my YouTube and, and see that uh, those studies. But the, Jude was questioned because Jude, he quotes from a book called... Uh, well, some people think he was, at least think that he was quoting from the book of Enoch, and the book of Enoch is a forgery. It wasn't actually written by Enoch. So some people are like, well, wait a minute. If he's quoting from a book that was a forgery, how can that be the word of God? Now, if you go through the study, you'll find that there are, there are a few ways you could, that that's been explained. And my own explanation, if you go to the study, is that... Um, oh... Like my thoughts here. My own explanation of that is that I don't think Jude was actually quoting from the book of Enoch. I think he was quoting from something Jude said that had been passed down by an oral tradition that was then included in the book of Enoch. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now for the video because we're running low on time. Now, I do see a question from either Bob or Mary Isham, and I'm going to answer that. And the question is when were first and second Peter written? How many years separation? That's a question that, uh, that uh, I think that's Bob Isham out there asked that question. Bob, love you, brother, and thanks for the question. The simple answer is we don't know. The complex answer is we don't know. No, I'm just kidding. No, um, the, the couple of things we know. Second Peter was written after first Peter. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, they were both written probably, most people think they were probably written in the early 60s AD. So there's probably not a lot of time between the two books, Bob and everybody else. Um, I would have to look at my own notes to know exactly what view I took because, I don't know, I don't have my notes with me. But, um, <laughs> but I believe that most people think they were written in the early, early 60s AD, just before Nero's persecution started. Nero's persecution started in AD 64, and that's where Peter and Paul were both put to death. Um, my guess is they were probably, you know, within five years of each other. But again, a little bit of guesswork here. 
All right. Uh, let me just talk quickly about Hebrews and Revelation. How are we doing? Yeah, well, it's not all that unusual for, for a Bible study. We'll give it a few more minutes. The reason Hebrews was questioned is because Hebrews doesn't tell us who wrote it. And so when Hebrews doesn't tell us who wrote it, and we don't, if we don't know for sure who wrote it, how can we know that it was written by the apostles or their associates? And there's been some discussion about the book of Hebrews. In the early church, some people thought, and, and some scholars even think today, that the apostle Paul actually wrote Hebrews. The only thing about that is the apostle Paul usually puts his name on a letter. Um, but in the end, Hebrews was accepted for a couple of reasons. One, we talked about the self-authenticating divine nature. That is powerful in Hebrews. It, if you're a Christian and you read Hebrews, it kind of screams at you that this is the word of God. Two, everyone agreed that it was either written by the Apostle Paul or one of his close associates. Some people think it may have been written by Barnabas or Apollos. Some people think Paul himself wrote it, but it was always agreed that it was written by, by either the Apostle Paul or one of his close associates. All right. So there was some discussion, like I said, because it is so important to know whether the Bible is uh, or whether a book is genuinely God's word, because once we realize it is, we realize that it is binding on our lives. Okay, let me, I'm going to finish up real quickly by just briefly talking about the secret gospels. Take a little extra time here, and then we'll have some last questions either from you guys out there or you all. Um, going through this a little quick, but we don't have to go through it very quick. The gospels that a lot of people think, well, these are the other gospels that got left out. We have, more, we have uh, gospels like the gospel of Judas, the gospel of Mary, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Barnabas, stuff like that. Hmm. First of all, none of those were written by the people they claim to be written by. The reason we know that is because all of them were written at least as late as the mid-2nd century. Let me define that term a little. When we say the 1st century, we mean basically AD 1 to AD 100, right? Jesus is born in around AD 1. The Apostle John dies in AD 95, give or take. So we know that none of the apostles were writing books then, and none of the people, none of the characters in the Gospels are writing books. In the second century and following, these other, these other Gospels were written basically because false teachers wanted to propose an alternate Christianity. And so um, these, these Gospels I have a lot of room here, but I'm going to going to write this word here, pardon me people out there, and I'll put a circle around it so you know it's not related to these. But the word is pseudopigrapha. P-S-E-U-D-O-P-I-G-R-A-P-H-A. -A. Sounds like we're dealing with phony pigs, but pseudopigrapha is basically a forgery. It means, uh, uh, graphe means to write, pseudo, of course, means false or lie. These are phony books, and this was well known. What happened was in the second century, like roughly a little over 100 years after Jesus rose from the dead, this false teaching, this cult, if you will, will became very popular, and it was called Gnosticism. I'm not going to write that, but G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. And Gnosticism, it comes from the word secret. And what they claimed is we have this secret knowledge. You see, Jesus' apostles, the stuff they taught you, or the stuff they wrote in the New Testament, that wasn't the real goods. We have access to teaching that nobody's heard of for like over a hundred years, but we found it and it tells you what Jesus really said. So it was like a way of trying to authenticate a phony Christianity by writing phony books. And the reason, the reason the church didn't accept these 
Gospels into the canon is they were clearly not written by the apostles. They were clearly written well over a hundred years after Jesus rose from the dead, and everybody knew from the very beginning that they were forgeries. Nobody thought that Judas really wrote the Gospel of Judas, or Thomas really wrote the Gospel of Thomas. Um, they, they promoted a false form of Christianity, and uh, there's other things we could say about that, but pretty much they weren't, you know, the, the, the book, The Da Vinci Code, acts like there were all these other contenders that the church rejected. Those other Gospels weren't really contenders in the early church. That's just pretty much made up. All right. What do you, Holly, question? Well, my Bible has a little reference in it about 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and it says that 1 Peter was written in A.D. 60, and 2 Peter was A.D. 65. I don't know. Holly just said that in her study Bible... It has a little note that says 1 Peter was written in A.D. 60 and 2 Peter was written in A.D. 65. That would fit the basic paradigm I'm thinking. 2 Peter, in that case, would have been written just after Nero's persecution began. But I think that's pretty pretty well in keeping. Like I said, I, I don't have those notes in front of me and don't have it all memorized. But that sounds good. Let's put it that way. So the Gnosticism, does that have to do with the agnostic people or that's totally different? Yeah, so the question was, does Gnosticism have to do with the agnostics? It's actually something very different, but there is a, a, a language connection. See, Gnostic has to do with knowledge. So a Gnostic was somebody who said we have secret knowledge, secrets that weren't in the Bible, but I don't know. Jesus maybe told Judas or Mary the secret information that he didn't tell everybody else, but... You know, we discovered it a couple hundred years later. And of course, these were forgeries. They didn't really. But so the word Gnostic comes from the word the word knowledge is what that is. Agnostic. An agnostic. So an atheist, as you guys know, is someone who doesn't believe in God. An agnostic is someone who says, I don't know whether it's God. An agnostic is called an agnostic because the A, A, is a negative prefix. And you put that with Gnostic and agnostic means we don't know. So I'm glad, so we could put like, you know, if you asked me the answer to a math problem, I would say I'm an agnostic about the math problem because I don't know the answer in all likelihood, right? So, but, but agnostic is usually used for those who say we don't know whether there's a God. Yes? Whew. All right. I don't see any questions from out there. Thank you guys for, for those of you who did ask questions. And um, uh, Kathleen mentioned she wants the notes. I will get them to you if anyone else wants the notes. And you guys, too. I can get you copies of the notes. So let me know. And uh, I will see everybody in Facebook land next time. Hey, uh, make sure and join in our Sunday sermon. It'll be streaming about 11, give or take.